those of you that aren't. Hallelujah. Boy, the praise team and everybody did such a great job tonight. Amen. I, I really appreciate what's happened here tonight. Amen. And many times, can I tell you that many times the spirit moves in order to break up the ground for the word to be planted. Amen. Good to see Brother Zach come in tonight. Amen. He'll get, he's going to get mad at me, but he can't whoop me. Not yet, or I don't think he can. I don't want to find out either, brother. I'm not offering a challenge. But brother, brother Zach came down here and prayed an hour yesterday. Amen. And I can't tell you what that means to me, to know that he came down and prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. That lets me know that it's not what he is, but what he can be. Amen. Brother Terry, it's always going to be I am weak, but he is strong. It's always going to be that way. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, my goodness. I think the Lord looking at this service the same way. And we've had a great move. Everybody's worshipped really good. But we haven't got out of it what God could have for us just yet. There's some victory. There's some victory. There's some victory in the house tonight. Amen. I got an idea. If you were not here this morning and you are here tonight, would you raise your hand? Hold them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. You can put them down. Fifteen. Well, that means today in church here at New Madrid, we had 103 people in church today. 103 different people. I think that's awesome. We had eight, eight in attendance this morning, and we've got 14. I think there's some more than that. I counted Cody and Haley, though they didn't raise their hands in disobedience. I'm not, that surprises me about Cody. The little girl doesn't surprise me a bit, but amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like I'm just bubbling over with excitement. Amen. 8 and 15. 18 and 15 of Luke. Luke 18 and 15. We will have the, the baby in dedication after service or after I'm through preaching. But I want to minister to you tonight. Can I do that? Will you receive it? I get a lot of compliments. I got to tell you, I get a lot of compliments. People say, you did a great job, did a great job, did a great job. But the greatest compliment that you can pay a minister is to do what he says. Is to obey the word of God. And they brought unto him also infants. Everybody say infants. That he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Now, how in the world am I going to preach a shouting message out of that? And this is, a, this is not, a, yeah, it's a pretty good analogy. I think you can understand it. We need to get the attitude when we show up for church 
that the little ones do on Christmas morning. They don't have to open nothing. But when they walk in there and they see a stocking or they see a present or two or three, they immediately, their eyes light up. Their face gets flushed. They begin to breathe a little harder and they get excited. We got to get that way about being in the house of God. As little children. As little, because that's what I am. I'm his child. Amen. Lord, help us tonight to minister. Help us, oh Lord. Help us, God. You've already been here in such a mighty way. But I pray, God, that as I preach this word, I feel you laid on my heart very strongly. I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice will receive it. And not only receive it, will begin to make changes to, in order to implement this word in their life. That we will begin to own purpose and, and try with everything within us to truly become as little children concerning the kingdom of God and the gospel of your name and your word in Jesus. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Generally, generally speaking, and I think it's fair to say, blind Barnabas, the man at the pool of Bethesda, the woman with the issue of blood, the man with the withered hand, the centurion with the sick servant, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, Lazarus, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. The, the ten lepers, uh, um, Brother Ken, every miracle that we read about in the Bible, if I called the name of the one that got touched, Brother Rice, there was a great need in their life. It might be dumbness, Brother Pete. It might be blindness. It might be deaf ears. Uh, in one case, it was a, a whole multitude of hungry folks with nothing to eat. eat. But there was always a need present. But the Bible says that they, everybody say they, they, brought infants to Jesus desiring that he would touch them. Now I don't have to tell you if you read this the way that it's printed that the infants didn't bring themselves. But they brought the infants to Jesus just desiring that he would touch them. Now there appears to be nothing wrong with these babies. But they, most likely their parents, just wanted Jesus. <laughs> they wanted Jesus to touch them. They wanted Jesus to touch their babies. Not because they were sick, but because they wanted to proactively have the blessing of God upon their lives. For when they begin to wade out into this great quagmire we call life, we need to get the same spirit and the same desire upon us. Jesus, touch our children. We need to get back to seeing our little children filled with the Holy Ghost, which is the ultimate touch. We've got to get back to we're praying our babies through in the altar. Stop letting them run around like little heathens and get them into the altar. That's what's going to change their life. They will only do it if you do it. Brother Pete, they showed up where Jesus was carrying their babies, desiring that he would touch them. What is inferred but not actually stated is the desire of those bringing them was for Jesus to touch and to bless them in a manner that would help them throughout their life. The disciples... Those in Jesus' inner circle, for whatever moronic reason, rebuked those that brought the little ones to Jesus. I don't pretend to know what they were thinking. But if I could guess, this is what their thoughts probably were. What can he do for them? We don't need to clutter up the master's time with these frivolous things. It's our duty to protect him from the less important ones. Those babies don't have any need and they, don't, they can't provide anything to the kingdom. Let's save the Lord's time for those he can help. And looking through the eyes of the flesh, it's not hard to see where they're coming from. 
Jesus was thronged, Brother Pete, everywhere he went. He had to go hide sometimes, Marcus. He had to go hide even to be able to pray. He had to go to a place apart to, to be even to be able to get any time for himself. And the disciples felt that it was their duty to protect him from the less important ones. But looking through the eyes of God, we must cry out as Jesus did. Jesus said, don't ever stop the kids from coming. Don't stop the children from coming to me. Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... I'll tell you what, if we ever get a hold of this word, if we ever get this word down inside of us, uh, Jesus, the Lord God Almighty, Jehovah, told Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. If we got a true revelation of what this scripture means, uh, we would wake up every morning as proud as punch uh, to be who we are. Because we are made in the image and likeness of God and he knew me before he formed me in the belly of my mother. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. The Lord knows the end from the beginning, and he doesn't work according to our time clock. He knew Jeremiah's importance to the kingdom before he was ever conceived. Before he was born, he was set apart for the work of the Lord, and the Lord even declared before he was born what his work would be, a prophet to the nations. Once again, Jesus declared the disciples a short-sightedness by doing exactly the opposite of what they thought he would do. They thought that Jesus would be happy for them pushing the children away. But the Bible said he called them to him, not discounting their age nor their apparent lack of need. Let me tell you something, saints of God, and you that have children under the sound of my voice, we can get a head start on the heartaches of life by investing time and prayer and spiritual education in them before life punches them in the mouth. You can set your children down. You can pray over them. Daddy, you hear me right now. When the kids are in the bed asleep, don't walk in there to check if they're sleeping. Walk and stand over them and plead the blood of Jesus over your children. Moses' mother, Brother Pete, this is phenomenal. Moses' mother only had him about three short years, Brother Terry. But, but her caring and nurturing combined with her teaching caused him as a 40-year-old adult to stand up and say, I am not an Egyptian. And he made the choice to suffer hardship with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season simply because of what his mama placed in his heart. Jesus' reason for rebuking the disciples was that according to him, such as these little children are those that make up the kingdom of God. And then he says, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter under any circumstances. Let me tell you something. I can tell you for a fact, uh, those of you that may not know it, uh, I'm about to divulge something about me. I am stubborn. I am stubborn. But Brother Pete, I'm not so stubborn as to not listen to a direct warning from the Lord God Almighty. If he says there's something I got to do or I can't make it, let me tell you something, honey. If it means rolling, if it means standing on my head, if it means doing whatever, I want to do whatever it takes to make it to heaven. And if the Lord tells me that I can't do something, Brother David, I don't want to even get close to it. And he said, whosoever does not become as a little child or receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter in. So many people want to be saved according to their own plans, their own circumstances. So many people even nowadays have the same ideology as Naaman. I want to do some great thing and, and I want to see some stupendous thing and I want to be caught up in fame and fortune and self-elevation. But I got to tell you, the simplicity of the gospel is just do what he says. I must, as a child, 
You hear me right now. Not even as, as one that we've let get spoiled, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, but I'm talking about as a little bitty baby. I must with wide-eyed optimism, with brutal honesty, with complete trust, receive the kingdom of God. I must as a little child without guile, without fear of what anybody's thinking about me. They don't look around to see who's around before they cry out for their mama. When they want their mama or they want their daddy, they open their voice and they cry out to the top of their lungs. We have got to without fear of favor, without worrying who's around us in time of trouble or in time we just want nurturing. Open up our mouth and cry out to our Savior. It's the kingdom. It's the kingdom of God, Brother Pete, which we must seek first. If we got to seek first the kingdom, we will not find the kingdom according to the word of Jesus Christ uh, as long as we come to it as an intelligent, smart, wise adult. But we must, be, must come as a little child that needs to be led. As a child that needs to be led. I must respect I must respect his authority, his majesty, his boundaries, respecting him as my Lord and Savior. Rest and assured that he will not make an exception for me nor for any of you. We must learn to trust him with all of our heart. We must look to him for all of our help. We must lean on him for all of our answers. He is our father and we are his children. He is our shepherd and we are his sheep. And we must cry out as the psalmist did, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He chastens those that he loves. He gives good gifts to his children. God forgive me. Brother Shannon, one of the things I pray every day when I pray through the tabernacle, when I get on the place of slaughter, when I get on the place of sacrifice, is I pray to be delivered from me. I pray to be delivered from my wants. I pray, Sister Mary Beth, to be delivered from seeking accolades. I pray to be delivered from seeking glory. I pray to be delivered from folks patting me on the back. Because the Bible says, Brother Pete, no flesh can glory in his presence. I must become as a little child. Satisfied with the simplicity of life. Satisfied with the simplicity of life. I must trust the Lord with all of my heart. I remember one time, I think I've preached about this before. Mama doesn't even know it. I don't know where I was. I, I don't know where I was. I don't know where me and daddy went. But if I'm not mistaken, it's when he had the little El Camino. And Matthew was too little to go with us. Of course, if he had went with us, he'd have just sat in the seat because we didn't really even know what car seats were. Or seat belts either for that matter. I've rode to Sykeston up in the back glass before. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Up over the back seat, laying down. But me and Daddy one time went to a junkyard. Now, my dad was a little bit weird about some things. He just liked to walk and look at stuff. Junk. Cows. Horses and sheep and just look at him, and he liked to wait out in the junkyard, brother, brother Pete, and just look. This day, he didn't get nothing. I'm not sure we were even after anything. But there was, I remember an old car was standing up on its end out there somehow, or on its side, I could see the bottom of it. And he left me in the El Camino with the door open and the window down, and I could see everything. But Sister Pam, he got over behind one of those old heaps, and pilfered at it for a long time, too long to suit me. And so I remember my eyes filling up with tears. And then directly, Brother Pete, I began to caterwaul. Y'all know what that means? I began to get after it, Sister Margaret, because I was scared. Because I was out in a strange place, and I could not see my security. Now, I was in the car. I knew he hadn't left. But I remember, Daddy! 
And I saw him walk around the edge of one of those cars. And you talk about the best feeling in the whole wide world. Because all of a sudden, I didn't need to cry no more. All of a sudden, I just dried it up. Because daddy was there. I just lost I just lost sight of him for a little bit, Brother Terry. But when, but when I cried out for my daddy, he stopped what he was doing and walked around to check on. And he didn't stop no more. He, come to, he began to pick him up and put him down, coming back to the car because he wanted to know what was wrong with the baby. God forbid that we ever get to a place where we don't, for, for pride or arrogance, uh, that we fail in the time of fear or in the time of, of despair or the time of perplexity or sometimes there don't have to be anything wrong, but I just need to feel his presence. That I don't lift up my voice. See, the arrogance of adults is, come on, you do it to your husband and your wife, we do it to each other, though we do have almost a perfect marriage. I do whatever she says. But grown-ups, now you hear me right now, grown-ups expect other grown-ups to read our minds. We expect them, if I'm sold up, she's got to know what's wrong. And then when she asks, we say nothing. You hear me right now? And what we've allowed to happen is we've allowed that same arrogance to seep over into our walk with God. And how many miracles, uh, how many blessings uh, are we missing out on because we just sat there? I said this the other night, Brother David. He said, you have not. You don't have to tell a little one that. I watched little Mac over here a while ago. I was sitting over there, and his daddy was trying to get him a Bible. Um, I mean, a bottle. Little Jack over there was. Try, they were trying to get him a bottle, and why, 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 why? Bottle in the mouth. Everything's fine. <laughs> there ain't no game playing. There ain't no beating around the bush. There ain't no guessing. I'm hungry. And see, the Lord responds to us, Brother Pete, as we're his children. He don't play games. If you need something from God, let him know. You new mamas, <laughs> there she goes. Well, I'm about to call them out, and I'll wait till she leaves. You mamas, you new mamas, you hear me something right now. Or you young ladies that plan on being a mama someday, you hear this right now. If you have to take your baby out, take them out. But come right back. If they cry, put a bottle in their mouth. If they need a diaper changed, change their diaper. If it ain't a bad diaper, flop them out on the pew and change them right there if you got room. But get right back where you are and get back in church. Well, why? Why? Because they need to hear the preaching. Because they need to hear the singing. And most importantly, most importantly, pastor, they need to be touched by Jesus. Say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Go back to our text. The Bible said they brought infants to Jesus. And the disciples said, no, get them kids away from here. The Bible said they rebuked them. Jesus said, don't you ever stop the babies, the infants, from coming to me. For such is the kingdom of heaven. 
What's getting in them babies while they're laying here on the pew? I don't know, but I came up on these pews. How many of us under the sound of my voice came up on these pews? Brother Billy, I was raised up amongst shouting, dancing, excited, worshiping, tongue talking, shout your hair down, preach, stay till midnight, even on a school night. And if we're going to have the kind of revival that the Lord wants for us, uh, it won't be a revival that suits you. Be ready to be inconvenienced a little bit. Be ready to have to drag some babies out of bed in the morning a little bit. But we're going to be here late. Uh, We're going to be praying people through to the Holy Ghost. You just better get ready. But let me tell you something. The problem, it never was a problem with us, Brother Terry. Because we built our life Not the church around our life. Brother Pete, we we scheduled our life around the church. Isn't that what we did, Pastor? Jesus wanted the children to be brought to him. So much that he openly rebuked those that tried to stop them. There's a twofold lesson here. Jesus wanted to let them know don't stop anybody from coming to Jesus. Black or white, ugly or pretty, young or old, rich or poor, it doesn't make any difference. If they want to come to Jesus, uh, you let them come. And the lesson that he taught to the disciples by the children, it was not intentional. Those babies did not show up. Well, and I'll teach the grown-ups a lesson, but it was a natural thing. They didn't set out to teach the disciples a lesson. They just hadn't had a chance to be jaded with the cares of life. These babies, uh, they did not know what it feels like to be lied to. It didn't feel know what it like to be cheated. They didn't know yet what it was like to be ignored uh, or to shove aside. They didn't also realize yet uh, what it's like being given something because you feel like you deserve it. Uh, babies uh, don't look at you for help because they feel like they deserve it. Uh, they look at you for help only when they need it. Uh, they cry because of, of want uh, because we teach them to cry because of want. Uh, they cry because of need because it's naturally put in them we teach them to cry because of things that they want they are born learning to cry because of things they need and my friends there is a difference the Bible says but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory saints of God can I tell you that we've never been mistreated or ignored by our heavenly father How many children have been destined for greatness in the kingdom of God except for being denied access by the caretakers of the kingdom? You hear me right now. Even I, God forbid, I feel conviction tonight. Even I have been talking about going out for revival, going out for revival, going out for revival. When Sister Casey will have over 20 young children in children's church uh, on Wednesday night. uh, And to the best of my knowledge, one of them has the Holy Ghost. Two, two of them have the Holy Ghost. There is a revival sitting on our pews, Brother Pete. You've got to teach your children they need the Holy Ghost. Brother Damesworth, my good friend from Steele, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost when he was four years old. I have been in a church service where a six-year-old was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I was baptized at eight years old, and God filled me with the Holy Ghost right over there when I was nine years old. They're not babies, but they're men and women of God. I said men and women of God. That God has called to the kingdom. My mission tonight is twofold. We have to get a fresh vision for revival among our children. 
But then we also have to learn a lesson from them how we should act regarding the kingdom. We must learn from the children because, Brother McKinney, the Bible said, except you become as a little child. So there's the, the, the $64 million question is how do I do that? How, Brother Terry? Has anybody ever told a lie on you? Sure. Anybody ever hurt your feelings, called you a name, looked ugly at you, disappointed you, rejected you? Brother David, that's what forms us as adults. So what we've got to do is forgive and forget and realize we love to hear preaching about the Lord changing you from being a drunkaholic and from being a dope addict and, and from all those things the Lord changes you from. I'm here to tell you that the Lord changes you from being pessimistic. The Lord changes you from the glass always being half empty to it always being half full. The Lord will change you and, and rearrange you from the person you have become because of what has happened in your life. But how do you truly become as a little child? There was a rabbi once that asked Jesus the same question. Huh? How do I go again to my mother's womb? And the Lord said, you're a rabbi? And you don't get it? Except the man be born again of water and of the spirit he cannot enter to the kingdom but Jesus also said except you become as a little child what do I have to do I got to start over and I'm fearful that many people that come seeking the Holy Ghost cannot get to victory because they don't grasp a hold of that true fact they can quit all the sin but they can't let go of their past. There's some people under the sound of my voice right now that you have let bitterness virtually destroy your life, destroy all your relationships, destroy your family. You have let things from your past flat out walk all over you. But I come to tell you tonight that there's a better way. There's another old song, and I'm about to close up. We're going to have Brother Johnny, Sister Jessica, and them come up shortly. There's another old song that says, I found a better way, brighter paths for my feet. And I don't know the rest of it, but the last line says, Since I found the Lord, I found a better way. So two things out of this message tonight is we've got to quit leaving our children when we come to the altar, but we need to, to start encouraging them to come with us. I'm not telling you to drag them all down to the altar. Don't misunderstand me, making a big ruckus. But I am telling you that you need to start talking to them. You need the Holy Ghost. You need, the, you need to repent of your sins. Say, well, they hadn't sinned. The Bible said to David, I was born in sin and shaping in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Let me tell you something. There ain't the only thing better than receiving the Holy Ghost yourself is seeing one of your children speak in other tongues as the Spirit God gives the utterance. You want to get excited? You want to shout? You want to dance? You want to run? You want to be jubilant and worshiping the Lord? What your children pray through to the Holy Ghost. And then it becomes your responsibility. Brother McKinney, as the Bible tells us, to train them up in the way that they should go. And when they're old, it won't depart from them. I'd like for Brother Johnny, Sister Jessica, and their family to come to the altar, please, facing the congregation.
there are some things I'm going to say to them that not only apply to them, but they apply to each of you as well. One thing in particular, Brother Johnny, I want you to go stand right there by that. This is just symbolic, but I want you to stand right there and I want you to turn around and look at your family. God's called you to preach the gospel. You're looking at your first pastorate. There's your first church. The first church you'll ever pastor is the one that puts their feet under your dinner table. Men, hear me right now. You are the head of your household. You are the priest of your home. The first family you pastor will be the one that sets their feet under your dinner table. You can sit back down. Sister Jessica, I'm going to remind you that you're the best saint in the church he's got. And how you treat your husband will determine how your children treat him. Boys, you've got a new little brother. You've got a mom and daddy that are living for God now. And your home is going to be a godly home. Your home is going to be a holy home. I'm going to pray for this family. I'm going to pray first for Brother Johnny. I'd like for everyone that would to pray with me. I'm going to pray for Brother Johnny, but I want you to pray with me. I want us to pray for him as a father first. It's more important that he be a good father than it is he be a good preacher. It's more important that he be a good father than he be a good church member. Can I tell you, your family comes before the church? Pray with me right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I lay hands on Brother Johnny. You've called him to preach the gospel. You've called him to be an important part of this church. Uh, you've brought him to the kingdom for such a time as this. Uh, he has begun to flourish and begin to unfold and bloom. But I pray, God, under the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, uh, that you will bless him to lead his family in the right path. You'll bless him with the patience and, and the encouragement and the love and the compassion that you had for him that he will show to his family. I pray. I pray, God, your blessings upon him. I pray you will anoint them. I pray that this message I preach will sink down into his spirit and he will someday be doing what I'm doing. I pray, God, you raise him up to do the work in the kingdom, but let it begin in the four walls of his home. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray and give you thanks for that. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Pray with me now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for Sister Jessica that that she'll first walk uh, according to her husband uh, in, in submission and trust and honor for him. I pray, Lord, that she will keep this home, uh, that she'll be a keeper of these children, uh, that she will be the nurture and the, and the, the touch, the emotional tie for these family, that she'll, she will run to you, Lord, as the rock, uh, as the anchor of her soul uh, to stay rooted and grounded in order to be a stable influence uh, for these three boys. Uh, I pray, God, that you'll bless her home. Uh, I pray you'll bless her life. Uh, let her realize realize the importance of a role that she can make or break her husband's ministry. I pray, Lord, that she realizes the responsibility, and I pray God blessings upon her life. I pray encouragement upon her life so that she can accept the great responsibility as a wife, as a mother, and raising these three children. I ask you, Lord, that you do this in your wonderful name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. J.D., come here, buddy. Come here. Do you realize what this is all about? Well, let me tell you, okay? Your mom and daddy have decided that they want to dedicate you. Do you know where you came from? Jesus gave you to your mom and daddy. Jesus picked you out for them. Do you realize that? You do now, don't you? Tell me where you came from. My mom and daddy. Jesus, right? Did Jesus give you to him? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I can't dedicate you to the Lord. Okay? You weren't given to me. But you were given to your mom and dad. 
Now, I'm going to hold baby Jack, and then your mom and daddy are going to pray for you, and they're going to dedicate you back to the Lord. Is that okay? You want to live your life for the Lord? You know the Lord died for you, and you can have the Holy Ghost? You know that? And you know how you've always asked Gigi to be baptized? You're about to get to the age where you can be baptized, okay? And the Lord saw you before you were in your mama. And he's going to use you as a blessing in your home and in this church. Do you believe that? All right. Jess, give me. Come here, buddy. Stand up here.
up. And as great as our faith is, it cannot compare to the faith of the living God. Now, I'm going to start with a quick break. Because you're the first one, you will always care more for your brother than you feel like they care for you. You will always feel protected to them. You will always be concerned about them. And even though you fight, you'll never want anybody to say nothing about your brother. And this is called the caring child. And this is the one Gideon's given to you, which he gives to keep, okay? I want you to keep it forever and remember that that's what you are. There's a child that's going to care for your brothers and your mom and daddy. You're going to be the caring child, okay? There you go. I want you to keep that, okay? It's a memory of this night, all right? This is called imaginative child, okay? And the Lord will show you what he's going to do in your life. And it will begin in your imagination. You say good stories to your brother, to your mom and dad. And don't ever leave an imagination because it's a hiding place, okay? And I know you've got a big imagination, but that's okay. That's okay. I always did too, okay? But this is the, the little brother, and that's going to be you. And you're going to be the connection between big brother and baby brother, okay? And you're always going to be a little bit older than them, and you always be a little brother, and you're always going to be a big brother, okay? All right, and I do do want you to keep that as memory of this day, okay? All right?
Somebody that is touching them. And pray with prayer and faith. Come on, everybody pray. Everybody pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray a covering over this family. We pray a connection to this family. Lord, let them know that they're never alone, that there's a church family that stands behind them, that stands with them, a church family that's praying for them, that several nights a week there's many people that are praying for them, and they're going to make it through whatever trial comes their way. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you let the love and the nurture and the care that we have for one another flourish. Let it grow, Lord God. Let there be confidence in it. Let them never be afraid. Anytime they feel afraid, they can call on this symbolic gesture, this anointed cloth that comes from this life, from this body of people, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, we pray, God, and believe. We pray and believe, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 